I'd like to thank those who made this possible. Levi, Thurza, Yuna, CJ, and everyone else who cleans up after us. So um, I will try to deliver the good enough lecture tonight. And I will be open to discussion. I want to just bring up a few points and, and prep us for tonight's discussion at this point. I come, if not to lead, then at least to cheerlead for art. And art according to Nietzschean protocols and discursive habits. Let me introduce my intention in the following way. I will want to leave time for discussion, as I just said, and for analyzing some of these images which Nicola Berman kindly put together. I want us to, to think about the image of Nietzsche while, while I um, try to roll through some of these thoughts. Well, what a relief to have Obama as president, to have more or less ridden ourselves of that creature who used to occupy the White House. At the same time that Obama is um, and his administration already want to help out with education and science and very enlightened themes and topoi, you, you will not have heard that that art is being in any way heralded or subsidized or supported. For Nietzsche, art would be up there with the healthcare system. Okay, so, so let us consider the way that art has been historically downsized and demeaned, even by the most promising and possibly beloved um, leaders that one could imagine or be blessed by. So that's part of a, the package deal since at least Plato to demean and downsize art significantly and consistently. And it was disrupted by Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. I'd like to address this in, in um, certain ways that I hope you find poignant and pertinent. I want to explain what, what the stakes are in, in what I hope to unfold tonight. Nietzsche moves art into scientific territory, which I will be investigating here. Now, why does Nietzsche move in this direction, which does not always separate art off from science, on the contrary, but creates secured fields of contamination which many of you inhabit when availing yourselves of digital and cyber web worlds and recodifications where art and science imply one another. For Nietzsche, the first scientist was Eve, who pit herself against God and the man, guided only by her scientific curiosity, which Nietzsche claims is always vetoed by God. So Eve, sassy and limit-breaking is associated with evil. And Nietzsche identifies with her and is all about Eve. This concerns us today to the extent that when God has the state on a short leash, all sorts of innovations and incursions are prohibited. Consider the restrictions placed on stem cell research until yesterday. So when Nietzsche is for science, this is part of his attack on Christianity. I'd like you to bear that in mind. Recently, Judith Butler honored me by writing an essay on my work with Nietzsche's text, Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft, translated commonly as the gay science. Um, at one point, I, I translated as the frolicking science. The title of um, Judith Butler's essay is Avital Ronell as Gay Scientist. In her critical review, she raises some issues that I would like to address today, taking another lap of a recent book called The Test Drive, where I consider modalities of testing as a displacement of truth 
and coming from the Greek word bazanos that links testing and torture. The test drive ends with a section called testing your love, a Nietzschean prompt, but I did not consider love in light of the rodeo show called philosophical history in that book. Love in Hegel and Schelling and its meta-historical schemes, for instance. That's still for another day, as I will try to um, think about some of the thoughts that, that are coming up tonight. Um, and I would also like to have given a meticulous consideration of Jean-Luc Nancy's essay, Shattered Love, showing what love discloses and closes what epochality mo love marks in the history of metaphysics. So I will leave this and Schelling's willed fixing of love upon an arbitrarily selected finite object, or Hegel's more loving reconciliation of the absolute with the freedom of the utterly contingent, or a rhetorical analysis of the declaration of love, the prompt to shout it on the rooftops, and the temporal regression of positive love for another time. When we can look at Schelling and Kierkegaard as theorists of the Christian revelation of the absolute value of love, the subjective and the personal, all of which Nietzsche takes under advisement. So let me turn to Nietzsche's love for what he calls science which is never entirely dissociated from art. If we are prepared only now to receive his version of the question concerning technology, this is because he ran it along the lines of a delay called forwarding system. He made us wait, holding back the scientific punch he wanted delivered. The call put out by Nietzsche remains the urgent question of a text that bears the burden of an enigmatic encounter with science. Nietzsche gives us science as an assignment, as a trust to be taken on unconditionally. Neither the first nor the last to make science part of an irrevocable curriculum, Nietzsche saw in science the potential for uncompromising honesty in terms of understanding who we are and what we can become. At this point, only the scientific interpretation of life is capable in principle of zapping those dubious mythologies and bad drugs that keep things hazy, enslaved, grimly pessimistic. On some level, science does not owe anything to anyone. It does not have to bend its rules to suit this or that transcendental power broker. In principle, science does not have to rhyme with nation, state, or God but should be able to bypass the more provincial toll booths of ever narrowing global highways. Science, if it wanted to do so, could, in principle, travel its zones with a free pass. More imposingly still, science could kick its way out of any religious holding pen and put down deadly fanaticisms in a flash of its idiomatic brilliance. In his rendering and genealogical breakdown, Nietzsche did not mean for science to become a servile instrument or of a corporate state, though he saw how that could happen. But when Nietzsche takes on science, commanding its future, Nietzsche had the first dibs on at least one or two of the possible futures allotted to the domains of science. He addresses the promise of science according to altogether singular categories expectations, and places his bets on art, the faithful cohort of scientific discovery. Art has given us the freedom pass with its complicated bylines and small print. Nonetheless, art mantled with its unprecedented poetic license drives home the will to power, which is also the will to fiction. Without this power couple, art and science, each pumped and powered up by the other, without this power couple, but certainly without art, says Nietzsche, we would, 
stuck in the rut of morals, dogma, and arid stasis, we would all, says Nietzsche, commit suicide. Art is our suicide hotline. What happens to communities that suppress art, revoke poetic license, and damage our capacity to create new galaxies of joy? We need art, says Nietzsche, or we might as well give it up. Existence, from Nietzsche to Heidegger and beyond, gets its essential buoyancy from art. But don't get me wrong. Art is not only a vital supplement to life. In Heidegger, it is historial, opening up the very possibility of history, instituting. It is the wedding to which we all must renew our vows. To those in the reed, Heideggerian weddings are big events, summoning sky and earth the fourfold. Art, to return to my main man Nietzsche, hoses down moral strictures and provokes political skirmishes even when its fundamental attitude is non-referential and steeped in unreadability, civic and hermeneutic frustration. So, in the absence of a transcendental seal, philosophy and science turn to other qualities to clear their paths and warrant their integrity. Friedrich Nietzsche has to steer between God and ego to keep things clean. Too much God or too much ego is destructive of the scientific aim and liable only to produce catastrophic imaginary or narcissistically warped aberrations. In any case, God rarely dispenses permits for scientific adventure, though philosophy has been known to suck up to any power of historical moment. To keep thinking on track, Nietzsche mobilizes love and personality. Perhaps somewhat surprisingly for us moderns today, who associate experiment with some degree of desubjectivization, the experimental imagination, as Nietzsche calls it at one point, implies a strong personality. It was Schelling who once remarked that the question of personality was egregiously left out of the philosophical field. Nietzsche, who involves biographies in the index of philosophical demands, skims off a notion of personality to make his argument, such as it is, stick. The lack of personality always takes its revenge, Nietzsche writes, in morality as a problem. So I'm, I'm laying out his argument, such as it is now, and not asking questions about what constitutes personality. What, what about such things as reserve, discretion, a personality that doesn't manifest or show itself as such? So here's Nietzsche. A weakened, thin, extinguished personality that denies itself is no longer fit for anything good, least of all for philosophy. All great problems demand great love, and of that, only strong, round, secure spirits who have a firm grip on themselves are capable. It makes the most telling difference whether a thinker has a personal relationship to his problems and finds them in her destiny, her distress, and her greatest happiness, or an impersonal one, meaning that he can do no better than to touch them and grasp them with the antennae of cold, curious thought. Part of a lover's discourse and a destinal commitment, the Nietzschean motif of the strong personality determines the sturdiness of thought. One enters into a relationship with those problems that solicit urgent attention. One's distress and happiness abide in the enrapturing movement of their idioms and silences. The sustained engagement with problems cannot be put into the hands of those who have excused themselves from the space of a vital encounter by means of ascetic subtractions or anemic inquiry. Nietzschean science scorns cold objectivist observation, limp grapples, requiring instead something on the order of an effective self-deposit 
an intense commitment, prompting the encounter of great problems with great love, scientific curiosity and experimental imagination trace their novel roots. Nietzsche appears to envision a mapping of scientific study that is erratically pulled together by the love born by a strong personality. Buoyed by love, such a science could not degenerate in principle to a hate crime against humanity. Yet the borders separating love from hatred are left untouched by Nietzsche. He does not consider the cold prompters of love or the ambivalent underworld of acts of love in world or science. He leaves aside the possibility that the most hateful turn is often fueled by love of a nameable cause, person, or country. When Nietzsche installs love as a motor force behind the techno-scientific urge, he does so to open the scene for an unprecedented generosity of being, capable of melting the moral ice age and a history of intellectual arrests. Until now, knowledge has been deterred from supporting the limber stretch exercises of human beings. To this end, love supplants the deep freeze of moral valuations, rendering the scientific pursuit on a par with what is felt to be irresistible. Why is it, Nietzsche asks in this section of the gay science, that I see nobody who ventured a critique of moral valuations? I miss even the slightest attempts of scientific curiosity, of the refined experimental imagination of psychologists and historians that readily anticipate a problem and catches it in flight without quite knowing what it has caught. See, this would be an, also an attack on hermeneutics that always knows what it will have entered and understood. It will always have understood, and according to Derrida, such is the case with psychoanalysis as well, that always finds what it was looking for, the phallus. Disposed by great love to devoted study, the experimental imagination does not settle on one object or line of inquiry, but as part of Nietzsche's vocabulary of force, it tends to shift ground and change objects with a sometimes alarming degree of regularity. In fact, love, to be true to itself, has to carry the fissuring break within its travels. It cannot be otherwise if it is to follow the itinerary set by the laws of becoming. Elsewhere, I have worked on the ethics of breaking up, cadence, the finishing off that defines man. The question of the Nietzschean breakup takes me through Heidegger, who rallies to his side against Wagner, and to Philippe Lacoulabart, who assesses the damages of the historial breakup and irreversible rupture. According to Heidegger, we're still suffering from Nietzsche's breakup with Wagner. And it concerns all of us, even those of you who don't think you give a shit. <laughs> The experimental imagination is exceptional in several ways, taking risks but also exercising prudence, practicing in Nietzsche's famous sense the art of living dangerously. Living is for Nietzsche an art. The experimental cast of being does not so much preview the advent of a techno, techno body equipped with the antennae of cold, curious thought but in the first place reflects a vitality that disrupts sedimented concepts and social values. Such a force of disruption goes against the grain of what has been understood as praiseworthy, promoting meanings that have been left in cold storage for centuries. Society values unchangeability and dependability. It rewards the instrumental nature, according to Nietzsche, which is to say the character of dependable, computable qualities, i.e. someone you can count on. And, and that kind of person is awarded with a good reputation. 
On the other hand, efforts involving self-transformation and relearning serious and constant rebooting acts that make oneself somewhat unpredictable <clears throat> are consistently devalued. However great, writes Nietzsche, the advantages of this thinking may be elsewhere for the search after knowledge, no general judgment could be more harmful for precisely the goodwill of those who seek knowledge to declare themselves at any time dauntlessly against their previous opinions and to mistrust everything that wishes to become firm in us, thus condemned and brought into ill repute. Being at odds with a good, firm reputation, the attitude of those who seek knowledge is considered dishonorable while the petrification of opinions is accorded a monopoly on honor. Under the spell of such notions, we have to live to this day." End quote. While science itself, and don't forget that for Nietzsche, science is primed on art, <clears throat> was seen to count on the strength of prediction, the scientific personality needs to evade the temptation of predictability. Prediction should not be ruled by an internal dictator or a dictionary of obligations. If one stayed in one's assigned grooves, everything would harden into place with no suppleness to assure necessary shifts and turnarounds. In addition to petrification, one also always risks softening, effeminating, so to speak. Yet if Nietzsche had to choose or lose, he would promote something that comes close to the texture of the softening that opens and glides, allowing for sudden shocks and slippages. The scientific personality, spurred by love, needs to be able to flow in order to move past anything that establishes itself firmly. The surge vitality provided by love drives the experimental disposition beyond its assumed goals. Submitted to constant critique and revision, the experimental disposition is capable of leaving any conclusion in the dust when it obsolesces, turns against itself, or proves decadent. When a result is arrived at, the experimental imagination suspends it <clears throat> in the provisional pose of hypothesis. The hypothetical statement submitted to critique does not belong to a class of positivistic certainties or objective observations, since it is never loosened from the affect that brought it into view. A truth or probability was, Nietzsche's stresses, <clears throat> formally loved. <coughs> OK, so. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> so, you know, I have like dozens of pages to read to you, but I'm ready to have a discussion if you want. <laughs> what do you think? Okay. So a truth of probability was Nietzsche stresses formerly loved. The scientific imagination is cathected on the hypothesis and itself becomes <coughs> different as the object changes. While it seems as though reason prompts a process of decathexis, it is in fact life and its production of needs that is responsible for criticism and revision. So Nietzsche then, here I will summarize, <clears throat> refers us to anything that we used to think was truth, <coughs> and even if we have to rescind it or discard it, we formally loved it, relation of love. But even probability was something loved by us, even supposition or hypothesis.
but love can't, um, to be what it is, can't endure the same object. So we have to shed our skin and um, start a new love and a new life with regard to any object or being. And so we have to adopt this critical pathos almost. <coughs> so, I think I will um, summarize, even though um, it's not summarizable in a sense. I wanted to explain something about the philosophy of America, because Nietzsche <clears throat> migrates to America in his work. America being the place where switching, switchovers, identity um, changes are possible, mutations are possible <clears throat> that don't exist in Europe or elsewhere, according to Nietzsche. I think I will. Let's take a break with questions so far, and then I will be able to resume <clears throat> the reading, okay? Or anything you want. So does someone want to make a remark or, um, or ask a question or something while I pull myself together? We have a mic. A traveling mic. No. I would, I would think that Nietzsche. <clears throat> I would think that Nietzsche doesn't regard personality as something unitary or static. And I wonder if you could talk a bit, if he addresses at all, about um, evolution and personality, or. Um, how, for example, it contrasts with reputation, which seems like an opposite, potential opposite. I, I would really thread this through um, something like Christianity, which is, um, <clears throat> don't forget that Nietzsche is really attacking everything that he sees um, to be depleted of something like personality. Personality does not belong, so to speak, in theology or serious, scholarly, academic um, elaboration. In fact, um, the cult of personality that we now more or less appreciate is very new. One was considered to be <clears throat> on the side of probity and rigor if one maintained a um, rigorously neutral stance. <coughs> so for Nietzsche to pump our um, assumptions with personality, first of all, <clears throat> does something that is strangely radical, because we don't know where to locate something like personality. How can you? Name it, is it substantial? Is it <clears throat> something we can define or identify? <coughs> so I would say that he's also attacking Hegel, God, and all those whom he considers to be bereft of something like personality. At the same time, Christianity does have a thought of person and personhood, and we would have to consider that as well. But it's a good question. Nietzsche does not elaborate what he means by it. One would want to, as I suggested, go through Schelling and see what it means. In Nietzschean worlds and dossiers, he's usually looking for a place of vitality. He asks of any thought or action or event does it come from fatigue, pessimism, Christianity, or does it come from a place of vitality and 
and something that we can love. And the, the lack of personality, the so-called impersonal, the so-called objective, he finds to be violences against um, what I'll call very quickly, too quickly, the human spirit, or the transhuman spirit. Anything else? I, I'm interested in the slideshow that you have going on. I noticed that people are not taking that. They're all looking at the slideshow, but that's yeah. good. Let's yeah, because I mean, talk, talking about personality, um, it's a mixture of photographs and then the, um, obviously cartoonish or like character and then more realistic drawings and it's um, I wonder what you have to say about the um, role of the personality um, in the author versus the sort of appropriation the transformation to iconography that's being that's taking place here and um, in many ways then it taking on a maybe second personality via the artist so there seems to be multiple personalities at work multiple Images at work, um, and again, like iconography, which is in itself sort of an object, um, is an objective thing. You don't really see it; you just register like this set group of meanings that you are meant to see, and it that um, have sort of been culturally agreed on at a certain point. So, I'd, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that choice <coughs> to display it behind you as you speak. We did want to give you some <clears throat> something to hang on to and also to um, give a sense of the way we've more or less incorporated Nietzsche or um, continue to, to try to see him and, and um, read him, even in terms of these images, many of which are from the time of his, um, in German, Übernachtung, which is to say when he no longer had possession of his faculties. Some of these he was posed by his sister, his awful sister, in Goethe's library. <coughs> but one we might look at is the um, famous Peitsche photo, um, which is the whip. Did, you, did we have this in the collection? This one right there. I don't know if we can freeze it or not, but Check it out. Um, this is something I've um, long thought about and tried to understand what Nietzsche was up to. He's posing with um, his two best friends, Lou Salome and Paul Ray. And um, he's, as you saw, he was, um, he was yoked. And I wanted to read this in terms of um, all sorts of possible protocols, including you know that the traumatic event according to which Nietzsche lost his bearings was when he saw a horse being beaten. And he threw himself, and this was in Turin, he threw himself around the horse. And I wanted to think about it because that is the um, irreversible punctuation mark of Nietzsche's losing his ground and mind, so to speak, to the extent that we can even talk this way. So why did he pose himself as a horse? What's his relation to horses? Um, what's his relation to Lou Salome and Paul Ray? Um, and how does Nietzsche always figure as a third in a couple? He was kind of in love with this couple. So he, um, and what, what is the zoography also of the Nietzschean oeuvre? Because there are always animals um, in Nietzsche and with Nietzsche, companion species. Heidegger wrote a very famous article called Nietzsche and his animals. So I would want to consider um, that photo, especially because Nietzsche, my, my question would be the staging. This one that you now see, he's still young, but the others, the, these caricatures and so on, 
That's what his sister, that pernicious Elizabeth Fausta Nietzsche, that little Nazi slut, um, <laughs> oh, um, she set him up in so many ways. Um, she was really atrocious. So, well, now that you know my feelings about her, but you know, I'm on his side. There could be, all right, we don't have to go there, but Thomas Bernhardt's sister wasn't great either. Um, we could do a whole reading of that. But who's staging, who's posing, what is the Nietzschean pose, what is the Nietzschean, this is, this is what she also had him photographed in, in this one. Um, so these are questions that uh, these um, images have us consider. Now, we, we have an image of Nietzsche in his um, most desperate place. And one wants to read this also with what he announced and declared, the death of God. Because what, what is this history where history stops, where biography stops in Nietzsche? It's as if we read it together with uh, Jean-Luc Nancy on, on <clears throat> the death of God, um, Nietzsche, Nietzsche's death precedes itself in a certain way. And I was interested in the precedent of his death, too, in these images. Here you have a typewriter. Nietzsche was, um, as Friedrich Kittler has also, of course, pointed out, the first to um, write on a typewriter. And you know that Nietzsche famously said um, about philosoph what he said about philosophizing with a hammer. So he hammered out his text. That interests me very much as part of the media technological track that I follow with Nietzsche, and thanks to Nietzsche. Um, what did this so-called positive object did it in any way inflect his thought? Here we are with Lou, of course, holding the whip. Um, so back to the typewriter. What did this object, in, in how did it somehow inflect some of his thought, redirect some of his calls? Nietzsche was also the first guy to have girls in his class. And you may think, oh, what's, well, you know, what's the relation between the typewriter and having women as students, allowing women in? Also, women, um, you know, until the typewriter, um, copyists were, were young men. And then they, they couldn't handle the typewriter or, or the telephone switch and so on, switchboard. So t media technology, despite any intention or historical punctuation marks, somehow opened the field to women. Whatever field it was, it could be the philosophical field. So those questions have interested me as well, if they are questions. But these images are meant to um, to just, here's all his animals also. This is not a pretty one. Um, so I just wanted also to say that we're talking about art today. And art has been drawn to Nietzsche and draws Nietzsche and is fascinated by the eyes that no longer see or, or see elsewhere and um, and these are all portraitures, some are decapitations like this one and I, I wanted us just to consider that. There's Nietzsche's famous ears which he says are labyrinths um, and so on and so forth. You artists may have more to say about this than I do. I just wanted to give you a, you know, open the um, dossier of, of some of these portraits. And certainly the fascination and horror that we hold for someone who saw so deeply and so much that um, there was a, a sudden break. Obviously, 
the break and the breakup also has to do with a self, something like a self. That would take hours of, um, of deconstructive energy. So I think I'm back on track for a minute. The principal axioms of the gay science are related to dimensions of exploration and discovery. Discovery is not seen simply in terms of invention, but under certain conditions as a way of discovering what was already there, inhabited, which is why Nietzsche sometimes takes recourse to the discovery of America, an event and I bring this up also because we're still haunted by the way America was so-called discovered. An event, an experiment, a unique stage for representing discovery without invention in conjunction with serious historical risk. If Mary Shelley had seen the discovery of America as an event that occurred too suddenly without the stops and protections of gradual inquiry, so this is a fast historical um, move through what it means to have discovered America. What does it mean for us today, even? For Mary Shelley, who wrote, you know, the monster, Frankenstein, um, it, it, the discovery occurred all too suddenly without protection, in some as a world historical shock of intrusive violence that disrupted all sorts of ecologies, material and immaterial, conscious and unconscious. Nietzsche studies the profound disruption to thought that the experimental theater of America directed. Taking off for America, he redefines the place of the experimenter, letting go of familiar mappings and manageable idioms. The experimenter must give up any secure anchoring in a homeland, allow herself to be directed by an accidental current rather than aiming for a pre-established goal. The accidental current becomes the groove for a voyage taken without helmsman, without any commanding officer or function, Nietzsche insists. As exemplary contingency plan, America allows for outstanding reinscriptions of fortuity. Its alliance with unprecedented applications of the inessential, which is the historical complicity with risk, gives everyone the hope, at least, of having an even chance. The fate of America, or this aspect of it, was written into its constitution as a land of discovery, and now to the accidental discovery of America where Nietzsche goes on a job hunt. A disfiguring translation of the Renaissance man, the American jack of all trades, is a kind of American symptom that Nietzsche catches rebounding to Europe. One is up for anything, open to the identity du jour, capable of ceaseless remakes and integral adjust adjustment. The American athleticism of identity switching has marked politics everywhere, brushing against ideologies of authentic rootedness or natural entitlement. It also means that anyone can, in principle, try anything out the bright flip side of which we count the art of improv and experimentation, including perform performance art and jazz. And music was always with science on this point, from at least Bach's inventions to synthesizers and the communities of their computerized beyond. Nietzsche's focus rests on the individual's incredible conviction that he can manage any role. The refined profile for role management, by the way, Nietzsche locates in the Jewish people who have had to rigorously play it as it comes, go with the flow, adjust, and associate if they're to survive. The experimenter is at once the experimentee. There is little room here for securing the range of scientific or artistic distance or more precisely, he supplies just enough slack to let one try oneself out. 
Everyone turns himself into a test site, produces ever new experiments, and significantly enjoys these experiments. This plasticity does not match the solemn lab for which Dr. Frankenstein becomes the paradigmatic director, weighted as he is with Germanic gravity and remorse over the meaning of his relentless experiments. Nonetheless, the opposition, opposition should not be held too rigidly, for Europe and America are sharing needles on this one, contaminating one another according to the possibilities of new experimental jouissance. Clearly, there is a price to be paid by the experimental player. One cannot remain detached from the activity of intense experimentation, but finds oneself subject to morphing. One grows into one's experimental role and becomes one's mask. America's increasing obsession with actors this is already in Nietzsche, before people, or as the French say, people. <laughs> they say, c'est très people. <laughs> now actors have political views, even. All this has roots in Greece and can be connected in Nietzsche to his observations on non-substantial role playing. So Nietzsche um, does a genealogy of, of propping up the actor as, uh, as that which is confused with its mask. Nietzsche is well within his comfort zone when the personal technologies of shedding and softening take hold of existence, when brevity becomes the correct tact to measure out a given stage of life. He is attached only to brief habits, he writes, describing a fluidity that allows him to get to know many things and states. Let, let's consider this. I'm going to read Nietzsche here. Um, I love brief habits. Here again, love. I, I've been tracking what Nietzsche loves. He loves brief habits and consider them an inestimable means for getting to know many things and states, down to the bottom of their sweetness and bitterness. My nature is designed entirely for brief habits, even in the needs of my physical health, and altogether, as far as I can see at all, from the lowest to the highest. I always believe that here is something that will give me lasting satisfaction. Brief habits, too, have this faith of passion, this faith in eternity and that I am able to, I am to be envied for having found and recognized it. And now it nourishes me at noon and in the evening and spreads a deep contentment all around itself and deep into me so that I desire nothing else without having any need for comparisons, contempt, or hatred. But one day its time is up. The good thing parts from me not as something that has come to nauseate me, but peacefully and sated with me as I am with it, as if we had reason to be grateful to each other as we shook hands to say farewell. Even then, something new is waiting at the door, along with my faith, this indestructible fool and sage. And this new discovery will be just right, and this, that this will be the last time. That is what happens to me with dishes, ideas, human beings, cities, poems, music, doctrines, ways of arranging the day, and lifestyles. Nietzsche admits at the same time that most intolerable, to be sure, and the terrible par excellence would be for me a life entirely devoid of habits, a life that would demand perpetual improvisation, that would be my exile and my Siberia. So now he's suddenly in Siberia, out of America. Or maybe America is a type of Siberia as well. Carried to extremes, the homelessness of experimentation turns into an unsettling exile, into the horror of being, when it demands nonstop improv. Still, the opposite of horror is odious to Nietzsche, a kind of political noose around his delicate neck. Here's Nietzsche again. Enduring habits I hate. 
I feel as if a tyrant had come near me and as if the air I breathe had thickened when events take such a turn that it appears that they will inevitably give rise to enduring habits. For example, owing to an official position, constant association with the same people, a permanent domicile, or unique good health. Yet, yes, at the very bottom of my soul, I feel grateful to all my misery and bouts of sickness and everything about me that is imperfect because this sort of thing leaves me with a hundred back doors through which I can escape from enduring habits. The experimental disposition then has to dismantle its internal and material lab frequently to keep the punctual rhythm of the brief habit going. A philosophical policy susceptible of significant consequences. <coughs> Nietzsche never places the experiment on the side of monumentality or reliable duration. It cannot be viewed as a project. So I think this is interesting for all of us, and Bataille will pick this up, which is Nietzsche's disdain for the project. Nor is he attached to a particular form of experiment. This is not the scientist obsessed with an idée fixe, but one capable of uprooting and going, for better or worse, with the diversifying flow of ever new flora and fauna. This degree of openness, though it does have its limits and points of closure, necessarily invites ambivalence. Those moments, for instance, when Nietzsche stalls dreaming of immense edifices and the permanence promised by contracts written in stone. In Nietzsche, as in Goethe, the artist, scientist, is at no point strictly or simply outside the field of experimentation, part of the thinking of personality. They cannot extricate themselves from the space of inquiry in the name of some mystified or transcendental project from which the personhood of the scientist can be dropped out or beamed up at will. The test site can always blow up in their faces or make ethical demands on them. For Nietzsche, this would remain a personal dilemma to this day. Thank you. I think I'll stop there. <coughs> deductive lecture, if you could give us some of your favorite um, examples of, um, uh, of art anticipating science. Of course, we know imagination anticipates science. This is obvious and vain. We all know about it. And today, science and art mix it up. Uh, I'm happy to be in the art world myself. But um, perhaps you'd uh, talk about one of your favorite uh, uh, connections in this, uh, in this area. Of course, we have the great um, psychoanalysts of uh, Flaubert and George Eliot in the, in the 19th century, but uh, maybe perhaps you have some of your own in, in any science. I, I'd be happy to respond to, to the question as it's posed, but I, I do want to make clear that um, when Nietzsche um, turns to art, at least in the way also that is picked up and emphasized by Heidegger. It's not necessarily um, in terms of um, an object that we could name or discrete instances of artistic production. It may have nothing to do with a product, object, or, or a positive history of art. At the same time, he doesn't exclude that at all. And he um, was, of course, erudite and, and careful and thoughtful. And one would not want to, um, of, all, of all personalities, philosophical, psychological, and other personalities that Nietzsche brings up, one does not want to in any way close the door on, on the question that you pose, which which is um, <clears throat> pertinent to, to many of us here. But certainly, their, their art 
to the, I mean, there, there's a way in which science may have forgotten it in its um, intimate um, relationship and even custody battles uh, with art over getting a grasp and a, and a hold on existence. So art and science, first of all, are not necessarily to be entirely dissociated, though Nietzsche does speak of the gay scientist and not the gay artist, and that's a, 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 something we might consider. But what comes to mind immediately, um, maybe in a non-Nietzschean way, is um, you know, uh, Levi and Thurza and I, we, we used, and Shireen, we were in Berkeley and, and um, San Francisco during our ute, as we say, in um, New York. And um, William Gibson was part of that um, experience, of course, and, and we all know that he created certain cyber um, materialities so there you have science. I mean, when you get into physics and, and so-called hard science, um, the, the very values of inventiveness and creativity don't permit you to really um, choose between art and science. They, these are poets as well. The question that I'm asking, and I, I only framed it very briefly as such, is why in this oppositional standoff, why is art being constantly demeaned? And one of my wishes is to bring science back to its um, poetic and artistic roots, which is something that um, Husserl does in a different way, of course. Um, he, he's bringing science back to its philosophical home base very afraid in the Mary Shelley way that science has just gotten up and invented a monstrosity that won't call home. And home might be art or philosophy or, or a true reflection, which for Heidegger in his violently appropriative way is, is where art um, opens up world and institutes what he calls historiality. So um, for these guys, these big guns, art is, um, is absolutely vital and really breaks open the earth and, and um, is a kind of force that um, is, is very crucial and may not be even reducible to an artwork. And, and we would have to closely read what Heidegger means by the origin of an artwork and where to locate it and what that would be. You know. that, that also, you know, that begins with Kant, who creates a wildlife sanctuary for art. Because Kant says, I don't want you to think about art in terms of a begriff or a concept, but just the form and what it does to a kind of um, inter play of the faculties or intersubjectivity. So Kant actually started protecting art, and of course Nietzsche is attacking this as well, by saying, leave it alone. It doesn't have to be servile to meaning, to concept, to any of those philosophical heavies that come in there and say, so what does this mean? That's philosophy. That may not be art. So Kant says, lay off. And in his third critique, the critique of judgment, he creates that space for radical free play, as he calls it, of art. But the, the contract that he signs is that um, no one should subjugate art to concept, conceptual ap apparatus. So we can see mutations. And since Kant, you don't even want to say which art work or what materiality are we talking about? I mean, if you weren't Kantian, then you're open up to all of those nasty issues like, is this art? I could have done it. Yeah. <laughs>
can't say, I don't want to know about that. Maybe not with a Brooklyn accent, but forget about it. I'm not in charge of that phallus, the mic, that's traveling. So. It's over here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear very much your thoughts on the part of Nietzsche where he falls out of love, uh, specifically that with his disillusionment in Wagner's work, and particularly Wagner's concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the total artwork, because it seems, I'm, I'm like projecting here, but this idea of the disdain of the project and of looking, art, looking for art in the fragment, it seems to be a, a disdained lover's view, if you, if you will. It just thrashing around in this area of Nietzsche's rejection of Wagner, and if that includes a rejection of the concept of the total artwork. I think you're right on target. It's a good thrash. It's a good work. Um, yes, yes, you're, you're not mistaken at all. Um, for Nietzsche, first of all, it, it's a question whether he ever fell out of love with Wagner. I'd say he didn't, because when people, you know, he kept on writing endlessly breakup texts like Nietzsche versus Wagner, the case of Wagner, Wagner's an asshole, Wagner, well, he didn't write those. I'm, I'd like to help him and continue to write against Wagner, you know. But you're right, he's, um, at the same, t and what does Wagner mean? And then at the same time, people would say, yeah, you know, you're right, Wagner, Brahms is better. And then Nietzsche would say, wait a minute, no one comes close to Wagner. <laughs> Wagner was a windfall. Wagner, I am so grateful to him. There's no one who touches his, as the French say, ankles, meaning no one comes to his, um, Gets, I don't know how you translate it. Anyway, so you're absolutely right. Where, where Nietzsche is breaking off and breaking up and separating off and doing the brief thing um, and also saying we need to learn the art of the cadence, this is against Wagner. He says Wagner has no tact, no rhythm, um, which La Coulabart and Heidegger say this is a major attack on, um, well, a certain um, development of thought of being. But Nietzsche is, um, but Wagner is the Gesamt, am I, I am hearing some stuff. I'm sorry, I can't control. Ni um, Wagner is the um, tota totalizing totality of the artwork and um, tries to harden into an icon. And absolutely, this is where Nietzsche feels obligated to break it off with him. So Nietzsche is the one who breaks everything off systematically. I don't want to program you, but he, he dropped out of school. He, um, he broke off with everything, with his country. He, he, when he says, I'm, I'm, you know, Nietzsche is a Polish name get those Germans off my back, you know, and so on and so forth. He breaks systematically without system, maybe, but with everything, whereas, and he was Wagner's uh, one cheerleader, you know, for Bayreuth, which he then said means bereits bereut, meaning I really regret this time where I was thinking that Wagner was the, the anti-authoritarian, um, fight the power kind of um, icon. Instead, Wagner sucked it all in and was very up, rather, and was very um, bloated with his nationalistic importance and wouldn't um, break with that. So Wagner became suddenly a bourgeois um, comfort zone, and Nietzsche had to, to break away. So you're absolutely right. It is always and again. But this, you know, the gay science isn't necessarily yet when he's ready. It's interesting how many tracks and traces show how he's always been ready to break up and break off with Wagner. But Wagner was also his teacher and his, 
mentor, and you should see some of the things. You, you get notes where Wagner said, I uh, writes, I understand you're going shopping. Could you get me a pair of underwear and get so-and-so a Christmas present? And while you're at it, could you change your text, Schopenhauer, as educator, because you forgot to mention me in it? So rewrite. So you get these kind of commands from Wagner. And we have to be grateful for um, Nietzsche's uh, escape route and that he took it, you know, in a certain way. But he never fell out of love with Wagner, I don't think. Yeah. Are we still talking? Um, you mentioned uh, Nietzsche's disdain for the project, and this gentleman over here also just referenced that. I wonder if you could um, contextualize that for us and give us the terms in which he was um, disdaining the project. Yeah, I would I would suggest that you you look at also Georges Bataille, his work on Nietzsche and his work altogether, where um, or Nancy on on these guys. The, um, the project is something that is always um, on the side of death in some ways for, for Nietzsche, especially Bataille. But it's also um, a kind of um, maybe stealth historicism. It has a sense of its beginning and an end and, and the way it, it create certain um, closural uh, moves around itself. It's, it, it's a certain metaphysics of um, seeing a, a totality of something to which you're going to um, devote yourself. I, I would want to think more about it, because it's, um, it's something that is a way of criticizing a, a, a specific rapport to history and to our relation to history. But it's, it's complicated. And I know I, I just mentioned it. In this context, it's, um, it's just really about um, the, the way the project somehow posits itself rhetorically an error because it has a sense of where it's going, what it already knows about itself, and doesn't split off or fragment or break down. It doesn't allow for failure. And it doesn't take risks in a certain way that Nietzsche is trying to develop it. It's also on the side of a long-term commitment, which in this very brief window of opportunity that I opened for Nietzsche needs to be um, if I can use an old-fashioned term, deconstructed, a long term. It has to be short term, and, and a kind of um, breakage has to be assured. I know I'm saying this very quickly, but I think we would have to read the text that I, I mentioned to get a, a hold on it. Thank you. Thank you. I hadn't heard before that Nietzsche's name might not be German, and I wonder in the context of it being this, this um, impulse for destruction, if it's not related to the Slavic term that would be Znitsche, or to, to destroy, so that might be some kind of association there. But um, you had mentioned in your opening comments that you were going to talk about the discursive nature, and I wonder if there's not some relation between his destruction of something totalizing like like the ultimate artwork in Wagner, and also, uh, for example, in, in the use and abuse of history, his destruction of uh, the objective and, and uh, master narrative and, and so on, the, the believability of history, um, uh, verifiability of history, if he's not constantly in the sense of the, the discursive opening up the space for the impossible, opening up the space for the unattainable as, as a systematic uh, measured into every field that he, he reaches into. I, I do think that um, y you're not mistaken, certainly, but um, there is 
a sense in which, and this is what I try to um, develop in the test drive, the book, the test drive. There's a sense in which if you're, um, let's say, rigorous and even almost ethical, um, because it's, it's weird to put ethics and Nietzsche in the same uh, place, there's, there's a sense in which you have to legislate and administer tests to yourself. This is, what, this is a gift that you give yourself according to Nietzsche. So one would want to consider the gift from, well, all sorts of perspectives. Certainly Derrida's The Gift of Death and what it means to give oneself the gift of a test, of testing oneself. And um, um, so when you're always testing yourself, in a sense, you're also testing to failure. So I think that, that might, and this is a gift, that one um, sitting right in front of you is, is the translator of the test drive in, into Spanish, Mariano. So you can ask him what, he, he's understood this somehow. But you're not, so it's um, certainly, I mean, one wants to think of, in terms of Derrida also about our struggle with the impossible. Right, because we're not interested in the possible. Anyone can do the possible, but um, kind of think about the impossible. I'm not sure that Nietzsche was, I mean, one can have and find, there's so many Nietzsches, and they contradict each other page after page. But I'm not sure that Nietzsche was um, going to decide on the impossible, except in certain ways that Derrida uh, is attuned to him because he's building something else, including the transhuman, the so-called ubermensch, or superhuman, superman, and so on. So in his um, affirmation of life and, and, and probability, I'm not sure he, he has that kind of, uh, let's say, commitment to the impossible. Though tomorrow I'll say the opposite. All right, but for now, I, I wouldn't want to have him go there um, for all sorts of reasons. But thank you. This endlessly looped slideshow kind of reminds me of Nietzsche's concept of hell as the endless return or endless recycling. Um, but I wonder what, a, what Nietzsche or a Nietzschean might think about the parasitical situation of the postmodern or the cannibalization of art or in art in a thoroughly mediated world. Do you want to say more? <laughs> no, I'd like you to. OK. You know, Nietzsche liked his cannibals. He liked to chow down and um, he'd go yummy, yummy. He wouldn't, Nietzsche says at one point, you know, for the strong, if you're strong, you can host parasites. You know, and there's all sorts of parasites. By the way, I'm a parasitical, not only Parisian, but parasitical expert, which is to say, there's different types of parasitical relationships, like commensual, like where you feed each other and fuel each other. I'm sure you have that in your life, Jeffrey, right? <laughs> um, maybe not. Maybe, OK. Um, so um, Nietzsche wants you to get to the point where you love your parasites. And um, you say, sure. You know, or the Goethean response, and Nietzsche loved Goethe. Not only does Nietzsche love you, he loves Goethe. Goethe loved to be devoured by parasites. This is, you know, a psychoanalytic turn where you, you love the very thing that you think can poison you, can harm you, can weaken you. So Nietzsche was also an, uh, an 
outstanding immunopathologist. So he wanted immunocompetence, and he knew that the way to get there is, is by um, tolerating and inviting parasitical invasion all the time, and germs, Germans. And no, I shouldn't, I'm sorry. And, um, and Nietzsche, therefore, um, would try to probably shift the relationship to something that, um, that might not be so damaging. And if it were damaging or it did bring harm, he would want to uh, put in a genealogical trace on that. Like, why is this harming you to be can cannibalized or incorporated or warped or distorted? Because one could, with a properly Nietzschean transvaluation of values, say that this is your strength. You can tell everyone, come and get it. You know, this is what I desire, this is what I affirm, this is what I want for you to take it, for you to cannibalize, which means, I mean, cannibals have, have good taste. <laughs> they don't eat just anything or anyone. So um, if you're yummy or your work is yummy to some, you know, power-hungry entity, there might be a way in which your work was destined to that or wants that or, or should perhaps this would be one's dream. Maybe that's where the work will disclose in a way that we hadn't foreseen or could not have predicted or imagined. So I, I don't mean to, um, to in any way um, not measure the gravity of your question, but you asked me what Nietzsche would think, so I have the um, daunting task of being his um, open mic right now and saying, this is, I'm, you know, this is what I think Fred Nietzsche would say, <laughs> that, you know, love your parasites and uh, love those who love you enough to, to cannibalize you, you know, but um, it's okay. The, the thought that there would be a parasite-free zone is the phantasm and the danger and what he would consider weakening, you know? Are we settled? Hi. Hi. Uh, you raised, towards the end of your, your talk, uh, those moments where Nietzsche seems to write favorably about permanence, um, you know, society as the thousand-year edifice, earthly immortality, and you seem to suggest that these were representative of sort of, of failures or impasses on the part of the other Nietzsche, the experimentalist, the transfiguring philosopher. And I was wondering if you could expand that thought a little bit um, or at least uh, talk a little about this problematic in his texts of duration and impermanence. Yeah, I, I do think that um, it, w it would take a while to do that. That's a very good reflection and intervention. I merely wanted to show, and, and, and if we had time, we would look at uh, the, his work on history, uses and abuse, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But just for the duration, let's say that it's very, very Nietzschean to, to refuse the Hegelian moves of a conciliatory, uh, let's say, synthesis or of, of making everything, even in a Wagnerian way, rounding it off and, and deciding and choosing for one over the other. Because there you are, and you think he's making something stick. And the next page, there's something like a contradiction. And this was, you, you have to imagine how astonishing it is for a philosopher, uh, if, if that's what he is. Heidegger calls him the last philosopher, to say, and this is part of his anti-dogmatism, too. He goes on and on about the brief habit he seems to be categorical, and then he suspends it entirely. And he says, yeah, but I would freak out. And that would really exile me and send me to Siberia. 
So um, I just wanted to show, I guess it was almost a, a policy of honesty to not fix on one of the arguments, just to show that, of course, he's going to swerve on this and not allow for us. And in that way, he's performing something. He's not even allowing his text to uh, play out as something like uh, a durable habit or habit forming, because he suddenly switches on us. So if you thought, if you were trying to cathect or attach to a thought of Nietzsche, he'll throw you off. It's a, it's a constant rodeo. And he'll just throw you off and perform what he's also telling us. He'll say, I don't like this. And then you notice that the text, uh, in an allegorical way usually, is performing the very thing that he, he doesn't like. So in case you suddenly wanted to establish roots in this idea, he's going to throw you off and not allow for a Hegelian um, roundup. So, um, I have a question. Okay. Um, could you tell us more? Where are you? I'm here. Okay. <laughs> um, you, you talked about the punctual rhythm of brief habits. Could you tell us more about the rhythm and art, or rhythm and love, maybe linking it to the typewriter and, and, and the breakups? So, um, You know, um, I, in, for that, I think I have developed that in, in, this, in the test drive. That's a very important question. It's a very important question. And here, Heidegger backs up Nietzsche when Nietzsche says that Wagner has no rhythm. And this has everything to do with um, history, with, with the, the absolute uh, character of man, of Dasein, what they call Dasein. And um, it, it is something that, that requires a lot of thought, as you guessed, by asking the question, like, how do we think about rhythm? There, there are many ways to think about rhythm. And why does it have such ontological weightiness for Nietzsche, who, who absolutely insisted on it as um, something that holds us together? So I'd like to pass on that, if you don't mind. It's, it's very complicated, and you're right to, to raise the question. You know. I think that'll, that'll have to be the last question. OK, I, I want to thank you all. You're, you're very thoughtful, and your questions were great. And you were very kind to me when I had my little nervous breakdown. So thank you very much. <laughs>